the hearing of the evidence. And the primary place where there was evidence, and GAO uh, commended our, our change there, was to use new price data. Instead of using households' recollection of how much they pay, we actually have the ability to pull the scanner data and price data right off of the store shelves. That change was the primary result in why benefits increased, although there were a few others. And again, uh, as you said, it resulted in a modest per household change, but it did put healthy food within reach for millions of struggling Americans. Well, thank you very much. And I think it's also important to note that just as any increases that come in the commodity title or crop insurance because of conditions and so on, it's built into the baseline every time. So now this is built in the baseline. This is not something that has to be newly paid for every year, correct? I mean, and, and because that was a 40-some year um, look back, as opposed to now year by year, you have a, basically a reset so that as it moves forward, this becomes something very modest and built into the baseline. Is that correct? That's exactly right. You directed it, so it is the current law, and it built into the baseline. Thank you. Um, let's talk for a minute. Uh, I have, uh, well, actually, I'm out of time, so I am going to wait and come back if I have an opportunity to talk about the Double Up Bucks program, which I think has been very successful uh, in the uh, uh, helping uh, people uh, eat healthier food. So looking forward to that, but I'm going to turn it to Senator Bozeman. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, when the 2018 Farm Bill was done, what, what was the CBL score for Thrifty Food? Uh, I believe the CBO, I, is, I can't recall whether CBO gave it no score or a... Uh, yeah, so a it, not, was, it was not scored. Not, it was not a cost. So that was the <clears throat> congressional understanding that it would be at no cost. I'm sure USDA provided input to CBO concerning it. And so again, we had a, a no cost score, and yet this cost $250 billion. So I guess the question is, who identified the Thrifty Food Plan reevaluation as a means to increase the SNAP benefit le levels? Senator, I, I think that's not how the sequence occurred. We went about undertaking the evaluation again. Who's we? Uh, sorry, FNCS. The secretary and I worked with the team yeah. in providing direction, but we were, we set forth, and I believe we accomplished, a sound evidence-based process to update the thrifty relative to those four criteria. When the team set about doing it, they found they could not update it without uh, occurring a cost in terms of reflecting current price data, the new DGAs, uh, food and the uh, food consumption and nutrients in food. So I've got section 4002. You mentioned the four criteria. Cost is not part of this. I'm sorry? Cost is not part of this. That's correct. Okay. So again, you've got a CBL score zero, congressional intent zero, USDA's uh, help you know, in regarding to what was going on, zero, and yet you increased it $250 billion without any congressional interaction whatsoever. In response to the findings of GAO, USDA indicated that the TFP reevaluation could have increased SNAP benefits by even a larger amount. What was the maximum increase that could have been applied to the, in the reevaluation, and how is it determined to cap the increase at a quarter of a trillion dollars? Again, Senator, that's not how we approached the, um, the question. The question was to solve, solve for what is our best estimate of a healthy budget-conscious diet. Had we, for example, um, allowed a wider array. Uh, we, and for example, we, uh, when we were pulling the scanner data and the prices for different categories of food, it was the lowest cost food in each category where there was. And so for, if we had allowed all foods uh, in a particular category, um, then that would have increased the cost. But we were very mindful that the word thrifty is a part of uh, the plan, and it is intended to right. be a low cost. But, but you felt like you had the authority to go ahead and do the higher categories if you wanted to. No, I think the, the, the law makes clear that we were meant to design and, and for the past 45 years have had a low cost budget. We were wanted to, we, we made decisions in keeping with where we've been, 
for the past four decades? You just asked me a hypothetical, and I gave you a hypothetical yeah. answer. Well, for the past 40 years or whatever, it's been cost neutral. Prior updates have been cost neutral, but right. they have not been done with the directive of the statute. So it's my understanding that uh, USDA recently hired a new SNAP director, Catherine Burig. Yes. And there are questions as to whether she will relocate to Washington, D.C. from Pennsylvania. SNAP is one of the largest entitlement programs in the federal government. What is uh, her official duty station? Is her position officially a remote duty station? If so, can you explain how Ms. Burig will operate a program that spends more than $100 billion annually? We're delighted to have Kathy Burig join us. She's been the SNAP director for Pennsylvania for many years. She's an incredibly uh, talented and experienced leader. Uh, all of our national office SES work out of our Braddock Road uh, office in Alexandria, and uh, she will be there consistent with her other peers. I, you asked a very detailed question, so we can get with respect to... Uh, so we can get back to you on that. Uh, so our duty station is going to be there. She's not working remotely. Uh, no, some. I mean, I will say some staff do telework, uh, or if she's traveling, she will need to be uh, working right. from a, another location. But yes, she'll be working out of Braddock Road, uh, our Braddock Road office in Alexandria. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> Senator Ernst. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and, and Ranking Member uh, Bozeman, and thank you, Undersecretary Dean, for being here today and for your testimony. The Department of Defense recently updated its statistics on military eligibility, which show that, unbelievably, 77% of young people, <clears throat> excuse me, age 17 to 24, are ineligible to serve in the military, and the leading disqualifier for service is obesity. Uh, this is a grave national security concern, and we really do have to do better to achieve those healthy outcomes for our young people. So included in the 2018 Farm Bill was a program that I had championed. It's the Healthy Fluid Milk Incentives Program. The 2020 to 2025 Dietary Guidelines for Americans had noted that 90% of Americans do not meet the U.S. recommended dairy consumption. Do you support this approach of encouraging SNAP households to purchase healthy but under-consumed foods such as milk and also other nutrient-dense dairy products like cheese and yogurt uh, to remind people of the nutritional value? Uh, yes, Senator. And we're um, uh, the... Sorry, we're very pleased with the progress that we've been making on the Healthy Fluid uh, Milk Incentives Program. It's uh, recently been awarded to uh, a, a new contractor, Auburn, and they're okay. making great progress. And we, we hope to learn quite a bit of how they both, what they're uh, incentivizing and then the details of how it works at the register. We feel like there's some stickiness and if we can pull those th two things together. Ideally, we can uh, take lessons learned there for uh, future work. Very good. It's something that I'm continuing to work on for this uh, upcoming farm bill and, of course, to help alleviate some of the concerns coming from DOD and obesity that's rampant with our, our youth. Um, so I want to uh, tag on a little bit with uh, what the ranking member was saying. A lot of us are very shocked at the CBO score that came out, and the CBO had raised its cost estimate for SNAP by $93 billion over the next 10 years. And I do believe it's important that we're providing critical assistance to those citizens that are most vulnerable. But we also have an obligation to ensure that these federal funds are not abused and that they're um, not taken advantage of. And we have seen a, just a, a shocking level of fraud throughout the SNAP program. So as we're considering ways to cut back governmental spending, we do have to maintain program integrity and carefully analyze both recipient and retailer trafficking and fraud. What regulatory safeguards can we provide to prevent fraud and ensure that the government funds are utilized for the truest intentions of the SNAP program? Uh, well, Senator, let me just say the, uh, the Secretary and both myself and Administrator Long share your commitment to uh, nutrition security because it is, in fact, national security. And mm -hmm. uh, I think the first, the first pathway there is to uh, make sure all of our benefits are offering meaningful support that meets the need. 
which is um, why we are making some of the critical changes in SNAP, WIC, and school meals. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to uh, flag back on that. Uh, but you're uh, absolutely right that stewarding the program with integrity is a, uh, a core goal, I, I, both in the act, obviously, for this mm -hmm. committee and for USDA. Uh, the appropriations uh, that we received both in 22 and uh, 23 actually provided a significant uh, increase in staffing for FNS resources that had fallen to a historic low while our programs mm. had gotten larger, while many more stores had joined the program. So we, we just needed more capacity in order to oversee the programs with, um, uh, I think, the uh, uh, intention and direction that you're discussing. We'll continue to do that and happy to loop back mm. with you if we identify an area where we need more um, resource or authority. That's good because we want to make sure that those dollars are being used for those families that truly do need this. Um, another area that I'm concerned about is that able-bodied adults without dependents make up more than 10% of the households who receive SNAP benefits. Uh, what are your beliefs about the ability of these individuals to work 20 hours a week, given that there are two jobs available for every person seeking jobs out there? Well, you, uh, the group that you talk about, known sometimes in our program as ABODs or uh, the childless, uh, uh, the childless adults, just to make sure we're all on the same page. When the public health emergency ends in uh, in, uh, Mar in May, um, we will see Congress. I'm sorry. Let me step back. Congress mm -hmm. temporarily suspended the work requirement um, that applies to that population during the public health emergency. So that, uh, that policy will be changing in uh, May when the public health emergency mm -hmm. ends. So I just wanted to, and as a result of the time limit being uh, suspended, that population's uh, participation in the program did grow. What we know about that requirement, which, and I think was originally set up and intended to support work, to promote work, mm -hmm. It's not having that result. There are multiple studies that show that it isn't. It does not result in increasing employment, and in fact, results in increasing food hardship amongst the group. So, as designed, it's not working. And uh, the White House Conference on uh, Nutrition Health, nu sorry, Hunger, Nutrition, and Health, the strategy document called on Congress to reevaluate and take a look at that rule to see if it could be reconfigured to meet its intended purpose, which is to support and promote work, uh, not uh, increase food insecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I, I appreciate that answer. And we do need to get back to um, getting those able-bodied adults off of the program and focusing again on the, on the families that truly do need this assistance. We're under extreme constraints with our, our budget and appropriations, and we need to find a way to make sure that those dollars are going as far as we can with the people that actually need uh, those assistance and, and programs. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Senator Welch is next. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, Ms., uh, the ranking member mentioned that the food program is the biggest expense. Uh, and Senator uh, Ernst, you were talking about having to make sure that the dollars are well spent. Uh, I am a strong supporter of nutrition. It was huge, huge a benefit to Vermont families and to kids. Uh, but any program uh, that we have in government uh, should always be reviewed to make certain that it's working uh, properly and effectively. Uh, but it is the case in Vermont that our farmers love being able to put food on the table to kids and families. I mean, when I talk to farmers, they're really, <laughs> they're really proud that they're feeding America. Uh, so number one uh, to each of you, which su what suggestions do you have about making the nutrition program stronger? And when I say stronger, to meet the needs of folks, and it has to be accountable, uh, but we can't substitute just an immense amount of paperwork uh, and call that accountability, because that essentially, in many ways, will get uh, things much more difficult for people who do need it. So I'll start with you, Ms. Dean. Thank you, Senator. I appreciate that opportunity. I mean, it's, a, it's in this moment of review, it's important, I think, to step back. Uh, I think um, uh, I'm trying to remember 
more than half of our participants have incomes below 50% of the poverty line, meaning they live in deep poverty when they, are, when they come to SNAP and they seek its help. Uh, so, Senator, you're right in reminding us to take a, remind ourselves of who, uh, who's using this program, and uh, it, is, it is primarily households with very low income. That having been said, uh, uh, a large number of uh, households on the program are, are earners. Uh, their earnings are so low that they need uh, SNAP's benefits to supplement. Right. Or senior citizens and individual, in individuals with disabilities, for example, with a Social Security benefit that is too low to allow them to eat healthily. And so we're uh, pleased that SNAP can supplement their income and as you're saying, more money at the grocery store, which is more money in the food economy, back to those Vermont farmers. Well, and another observation that I had in Vermont is that many of these food programs, including at schools, there's an enormous amount of community participation from local folks who find this a really wonderful way uh, to contribute to the community. So there's a lot of volunteer effort that goes into it, everything from the delivery of meals to the school uh, lunch program. Uh, can, uh, per can each of you comment on that? Yeah, absolutely. Maybe I'll ask Administrator Long to talk about one of our um, m most wonderful community enhancements in school food, uh, which is farm to school, obviously a, a cherished Vermont. Uh... Yeah, absolutely. I, I would certainly agree with you, Senator, that uh, bringing local foods into school is- Are you in the microphone? Oh, in the church? Yeah. I, I am. Sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah. Thank you. Um, I would certainly agree with you, Senator, that uh, the f bringing local foods into schools really is a way to pull the community together. Uh, you know, thanks to the support of Congress, we've had a long-standing farm-to-school program that was recently renamed for Senator Leahy. Uh, that has really we've we've been able to fund over a thousand projects that have made those connections between schools and communities and their local producers, and it, it and it can be transformative. Um, I'll also just quickly flag that we we've, we've that's been a long-standing program, a little in place a little over a decade. Uh, and at USDA, we've recently made other efforts to support local food uh, being even more present in, present in schools. Our sister agency, the Agricultural Marketing Service, has been providing funding to states. I believe we funded over 30 states to date uh, to, for them to assist schools and local producers in making those connections. Yeah, I'd be very interested in working with folks on that farm to school because I think all of us are really supportive of that local agricultural component uh, that's really near and dear to our communities. Uh, talking about the kids at school, you know, we, I was at a Saint, I was at Saint Albans, and there's like 80 percent of the kids who are eligible. It's a, it's really astonishing because it's a statement about our economy as much as anything else, uh, in the way people are living and trying. In this, it's an incredible burden on the schools too because they're taking on so much more responsibility for so many different areas. But I think that's not just true in Vermont; it's true all around the country, and there is this additional benefit of the socialization of kids eating at lunch rather than being on their devices. Uh, has there been any study of what the social benefits are of the food security for the kids at school? Well, I think there are, there are a number of studies that show the benefits of the school, new, school meals program, uh, including the nutritional benefits. Kids who eat school meals are more likely to consume fruits and vegetables and milk. Uh, than their peers who don't participate in the program. Um, you know, you certainly mentioned that the value of, of a community sitting down and eating together uh, and socializing, that, that is something that we have certainly seen has been beneficial from something called the Community Eligibility Provision, right. which is a program within the School Lunch uh, Act that allows lower income communities to serve meals, healthy meals to all kids. Right. Uh, and it really does encourage uh, increased participation, it reduces stigma, and it does significantly reduce that administrative burden that you were referring okay. to earlier. Uh, thank you very much, I'm over my time. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Senator Marshall. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Let me just clear my th voice just for a second here with some delicious whole milk. <laughs> the greatest drink known to mankind, known to humankind. And my big concern with these new WIC guidelines coming out is they're decreasing by eight quarts the, uh, the milk per month for breastfeeding women. I just remember my grandma, the greatest nutritionist of all time, uh, saying that milk was so important for breastfeeding moms. And Guess why? As an obstetrician, I learned the same thing. So I'm concerned about the WIC guidelines. I'm concerned about the fact that whole milk is not in schools. 
Um, this, this skim milk just simply doesn't have the, the, the good taste. We're going to have a generation of men and women with osteoporosis a decade sooner than a generation where we were all raised on milk, whole milk by that. And by the way, did I mention it's good for absorbing fat-soluble vitamins, A, D, and, and K? Chocolate milk, it's better than no milk, but the whole milk is the key. Okay, so on to SNAP. Let me just note that you did not share this with the whole committee. So. The, the, the milk? I thought I, I tried to get it in here, but they wouldn't let me, Madam Chair. They okay. wouldn't. I would love to. Okay, on to, to SNAP. I want to make it clear. I want every person in America that's in need that they get food. They get the food. I don't want kids going hungry, that nutrition is so important. Uh, you, you know, from preconception to, to the pregnancy, uh, it's, it's all so important. But the SNAP budget is impacted by inflation, just like you know families back home are. So we have groceries that are up at least 18% uh, over the past two years. Um, so our food inflation since January 2021 uh, is up 20%, but the SNAP benefits have went up 50%. So I guess my question for you, um, Madam Secretary, is why are SNAP benefits outpacing inflation? And and where was the congressional authority to increase spending beyond inflation? Uh, Senator, first let me say uh, we agree with you on increasing dairy consumption, and uh, we actually believe the, the WIC food package alignment uh, is to the dietary guidelines, but um, we are trying to make the package more res uh, responsive to what parents are looking for, more flexible, more options. So cheese, yogurt, yogurt in container sizes that parents want, which we think will increase overall redemption of the dairy benefit. Uh, so, and look forward to uh, the reg is out, our proposed rule is out, comments due on Tuesday. So please uh, uh, give us your comments. With respect to SNAP, I think we're, there are a couple of layers in there. So thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, SNAP uh, benefits are adjusted each year on October 1st to reflect food inflation so that the program doesn't lose purchasing power each year. Almost all of our food programs do that. And we really uh, thank Congress for building in that automatic adjuster so that the purchasing power doesn't decrease. So that was one of the changes. Uh, the other change would, of course, be the thrifty food plan adjustment that we uh, talked about earlier in the hearing, uh, where the uh, um, because we our estimate of the cost of a, a healthy budget conscious diet had gone, went up by 21 percent. That and that translated into increased SNAP benefits. So that was. Um, that was also part of the increase. And we did that reevaluation at the direction of Congress from the 2018 Farm Bill. Um, the rest of it, I'd have to, if it's okay with you, we'll take a look uh, with your staff right. and sort out uh, whether participation or other factors were part of those increases. Great. And I just want to emphasize that mainly because of inflation, SNAP was spending $65 billion a year in 2018-19 frame to $110 billion. So inflation uh, for groceries impacts everybody, including the federal government. I want to turn uh, just for a second uh, to, to some of the states are not following the, the requirements for exceptions to getting staff, the working requirements. In fact, 18 uh, states are currently using waivers despite their unemployment being below 6%. 10% uh, of SNAP recipients are, are able-bodied adults without dependents. So why isn't the USDA enforcing the law? Why aren't they, uh, wh why are we letting these states get away with, with uh, this waiver when they don't qualify for it? Well, um, uh, let me, so I probably didn't say it clearly earlier, but Congress suspended the three month time limit or the um, able-bodied adult work requirement for the duration of the public health emergency. So that's, that's what's going on now. And we have been working uh, fairly aggressively with states to ensure that they are uh, re, uh, reapplying, or sorry, reinstating the law uh, when that uh, time limit suspension is over. Um, the rule is incredibly complicated, uh, it, and we often see uh, individuals who should be exempt from it falling prey to it. And you know, just let me spend a moment underscoring this rule applies to veterans, homeless individuals, a 19-year-old who's just aged out of foster care and might struggle to right. find work. So I, I pre again, I want everyone that we have to prioritize who gets the, the funding for the food. I don't want anyone to go hungry, but when we have 7 million able-bodied men between the ages of 25 and 45 that aren't working, potentially 
potentially qualifying for SNAP benefits. It just doesn't seem fair that, that there, are, there are people on the other end of the spectrum that truly, truly need the help uh, when there are so many open jobs in this, na in this nation. I think it's time to get rid of the waivers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Booker. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Senator Klobuchar just walked in. I'm, I'm so, you are bumped. I'm sorry. People, they, we keep moving in the committee. I apologize. <laughs> I apologize. I, I, didn't. I didn't have another committee hearing next. Yes, Third yes. One, I, would. All of, I want to thank all of our okay. members, including the chairman of Judicial okay. Committee, who are, are uh, going back and forth and back and forth. So appreciate okay. it. But Senator Klobuchar, you are next. All right. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, thank you for for your good work, and um, Minnesota has a long history, way back to Hubert Humphrey, was involved in the nutrition programs, and we care a lot about them. Um, Under Secretary Dean, I want to thank you for your visit to our state um, in October of last year to see a SNAP employment and training site. Uh, with county commissioners and the Minnesota Department of Human Services staff. And I understand you had a chance to see firsthand the collaborative work being done with the state and local government to support SNAP ENT. Can you discuss in more detail how the Minnesota program helps participants overcome barriers to employment and um, just about how great the program is in Minnesota, basically. That's my question. <laughs> well, Senator Klobuchar, you're right. It is a great program, and I think it res responds to the questions I've gotten from a, a couple of members about we've got um, uh, SNAP participants who are un- or underemployed, and we've got uh, uh, vacant open jobs. Now, not not all SNAP participants are qualified for the open jobs, but there are plenty who are. And there are also plenty with a little bit of help, a little bit of skill uh, building, uh, could could uh, go from being um, uh, a SNAP participant who's unemployed to uh, someone who is employed. And the program in Hennepin County is phenomenal. Um, it is uh, basically there is an organization in the county who is buying uh, houses up for foreclosure, uh, takes the houses on, and then working with um, journeyman carpenters, uh, SNAP participants or uh, other ind other individuals as a part of this workforce training program are trained by these skilled um, uh, skilled carpenters, plumbers, electricians on how to do uh, construction because there is a huge demand for skilled construction workers in uh, Minneapolis. I guess it's a booming city. Oh, throughout our state, yes. Right, and so here we have uh, individuals where are, who might not be skilled or ready for that job, but they're getting robust training. These are also, several of the individuals are also um, ex-offenders. They uh, So they had some issues they had to work through with getting a driver's license, in some cases learning to drive, dealing with uh, some of the barriers that they have to work, and the program offered okay. them Okay. afternoon a day. Thank you. Do that. Thank you. Um, just to move to the rural part of our state, um, could you talk about how USDA will support expansion of SNAP online to small and independent retailers um, who may face challenges implementing SNAP online? And it's not just rural, but it would be particularly helpful there, I think. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, in March of 2020, we had about 30,000 SNAP participants redeeming benefits online through a pilot we were operating at the time. Now there are 4 million households who are able to shop online. This has been an incredible revolution in the program. Um, interestingly enough, it's only about 180 retailers, in many cases representing thousands of outlets who are, uh, who are on, uh, on board with us, and about half of them are small and independent grocers. It is our absolute priority to focus on supporting small and independent grocers, whether they be uh, in the city or rural, to be able to join. They don't have payment platforms. They may not be, uh, they may not have a staff of accountants and technologists to help them stand up the work. So we've given a grant to the National Grocers Association to work directly with those retailers to help bring them on board. Okay, thanks. Uh, last question, food banks in our state, uh, like Second Harvest Heartland, have seen a 40% reduction about 7 million fewer pounds in federal commodities in the last year. Uh, while USDA recently announced another uh, 943 million in purchases, it likely will not be able to fill the gap. Um, the program has to remain responsive to excess supply, increased demand. Could you be able to speak to the USDA's plans to ensure consistent access to food for our country's food banks, uh, whether through the regular 
TFAP spending or through the CCC purchases. Thank you for lifting up uh, this amazing uh, community of partners across the country who help ensure that our neighbors are fed. Uh, we know that food banks are struggling. They faced the same food inflation that we've talked about earlier, supply chain difficulty, and meet all the while while families are still showing up seeking their help. The Secretary is absolutely committed to the Emergency Food Network and actually announced $1.5 billion uh, in additional funds on top of what uh, Congress provides to uh, uh, bring our total uh, support for the program to about $2 billion for FY23. We will continue to monitor how... Uh, how our partners are faring, and um, uh, while I can't speak for the secretary or commit his uh, what he'll do with CCC, I know this is of deep interest and concern to him. Thank you. Thank you. you. Senator Grassley. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and Senator Boozman. Uh, SNAP has historically reflected the health of the economy. When employment rates decrease, SNAP participation rates decrease. In his State of the Union message, Biden's uh, rightfully uh, touted 3.4% uh, unemployment of 50-year low. Now, SNAP participation is at more than 41 million people, 12% higher than it was in February 2020. The cost of federal nutrition assistance has increased 300% from 63 billion 19 to uh, 149 billion 22. As the current ranking member of the Budget Committee, I intend to stress the importance of budget and spending decisions being made in the so we can work towards putting in place a budget process that works. Yesterday, CBO released their latest report on the federal budget outlook. That project, they project that growing federal spending and borrowing leave us with an annual budget deficit of 2.9 trillion by 2033. And we have to start tackling that issue right now. Now, most relevant to today's hearing, CBO says that total spending on SNAP will exceed one and two tenths trillion over the next decade. That is a staggering statistic, especially considering that when we were developing the last farm bill, the applicable number was 664. Our people's confidence in SNAP is undermined when this administration usurps Congress's power of the purse and very unilaterally increases the program's cost by hundreds of billions of dollars without any concern to the fiscal impact and the impact on inflation. So before I ask questions, I'm going to kind of sum up a philosophy I have. I don't know how it's shared by other people. But February 2020, we had X number of money and people on food stamps. And then we had to intervene and spend a heck of a lot of money before the pandemic. So I assume if you do something because you have a pandemic, you have an emergency, that when that emergency is over, you go back to what's normal. And normal would be February 2020, plus inflation, plus the number of people on that, that have increased in population. And that figure that came out of the Budget Committee is nothing similar to that today or with what they were projecting, with the reality of if you didn't have the pandemic. So the pandemic cannot be used as an excuse to ramp up federal spending. So my question to you, Under Secretary, what role do you think the increase in food and nutrition spending has contributed to food inflation for middle class families that do not qualify for SNAP? I see. Well, let me just first remark if I can offer a friendly amendment on your principle, I would argue uh, a program share of GDP, its share of the economy. Uh, you were talking about actual um, real spending, which I appreciate. I think uh, its uh, share of the uh, GDP is probably. Uh, a better marker, and I do expect that SNAP will return uh, return back um, 
as we see participation fall in response to a, a, a stronger economy. That does take longer among slow income households. We saw that after the Great Recession too, right? They are often uh, first fired, last hired, and their ability, uh, when the economy recovers, it doesn't always include um, everyone equally. And so it will just take a little longer, I would imagine, for participation to abate, but we expect to see that. Um, in terms of the, uh, the broader question you asked, that might be a better question for our Office of Chief Economist, and I will check in with them, but it's important to remember that while SNAP spending is extraordinarily important to the households who receive it, benefits modest though they are, it is actually a relatively small share of the overall uh, ag economy and food economy, and we can get that to you, sir. Uh, I, I, uh, glad to hear your rebuttal to what I said, but I, did, did I interpret you right that you do expect the food stamp spending to get back to a level of February 2020 plus inflation plus increase in population? Probably not as quick to tail because households are equally shaped in recovery. Okay. And that's, that'll be the issue. Do I have time for one more question? we happy to have you ask a question and have a short answer, so thank you. Okay. Uh, I've got an introduction, to a long introduction to my next question, but I gotta go immediately to my question. It, but it deals with the air rate. Mm -hmm. In your time as undersecretary, what have you done to lower the air rate, and why do, why do we not have an air rate update since 2019? Uh, briefly, uh, Congress suspended uh, the collection, uh, the QC system, uh, for in, in a way that resulted in us not being able to uh, publish error rates for 20 or 21. We will for FY22, and I will uh, tell you in candor, I expect that it will be higher than it was the last time we had an error rate, partly because of how much change that has been going on during the pandemic with respect to operations. And um, we have been aggressively addressing this issue with states and happy to follow up with your office. office. Thank you. Yeah. Very interested in interested in app for the pandemic going to be after the pandemic. And anecdotally, what I heard in New York was that SNAP before the pandemic helped, but it was so little. It's like, how much is a, me a, a day? Two dollars? and It's two dollars per meal. It's two dollars per meal. So it's, it didn't actually cover the cost for most families. So it was a, just, I want to, this is for Senator Grassley. My understanding was it just didn't do enough. It was good and great and one of the most generous things we do here in Congress, but it didn't, it didn't do enough to address child poverty. And so what happened for most families in New York, the fourth week in every month, kids had to have low quality foods, high carb, high fat, high salt, cheap food. And so they constantly, it, it increased chronic obesity. What we did during the pandemic is we fixed a bunch of the problems with the SNAP program. We made it really easy to get. We made it easier to qualify. We streamlined everything, and we made it more generous, and it helped. It actually helped people get out of poverty and addressed hunger in a way we've never, because we had this urgent, all lost their job. So in answer to is pandemic, change that actually people and then assess to be helped still is it there an increase in uptake uh, uptick is the benefit rich enough or not rich enough is it still too too little and then give us a real estimate of what would it take to address hunger in in the families that need it and then answer your question because I don't think snap was working that well before the pandemic and we fixed a lot of problems during the pandemic which is why a lot of advocates want to continue what we did during the pandemic because it fixed stuff but I want to give you a much clearer answer to your question because I want to solve hunger, and, and you're exactly right, because it doesn't. If, if we were doing everything right in 2020, it wouldn't make sense to be increasing massively. I think the biggest problem is we weren't doing everything right in 2020, and we should, you and I should look at what we can fix together, what the number should be, and what aspirationally we can grow over time, because I think you asked the exact right questions. So thank you, Senator Grassley, for your interest in SNAP. Um, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about just Grassley has to leave. 
SNAP does what the right people, and it's too hard to access. So a lot of Greek. So in fiscal year, 2.5 million New Yorkers participating in SNAP. Over 850,000 of them were children. So reduce <clears throat> the increase. and SNAP benefits from plan update were long overdue. This is the main thing I was wanted to address for Senator Grassley. Um, <clears throat> and it uplifted over 2 million people above the poverty line, including 1 million children. Poverty was reduced from an additional 20 million people, including 6 million children. SNAP is vital to our constituents and all of our constituents in urban, suburban, and rural communities. Participation in SNAP has been shown to lead to improved health outcomes, lower medical costs, improved education, economic security, and self-sufficiency. So Under Secretary Dean, in your opinion, how vital is it to, the, for, to Congress to protect SNAP from potential cuts that would benefits were lowered for America 2023 Farm Bill. And I'd like you to use this opportunity to explain what did we fix during the pandemic that needed fixing, including what I just mentioned, the Thrifty Food Plan. Uh, what should the actual benefits be if it was a dream scenario and why? So give us your dream and why. And then let's make the case that these changes are important for this committee to look at holistically, not just an example as to what we used to spend and what we're spending today, because I think that's the wrong conversation. I think the conversation is, are we meeting the needs of our constituents or are we not? Thank you, Senator Gillibrand. And uh, while you were speaking to Senator Grassley, I, I worried I had not been clear in my answer to him that uh, on, on the necessary adjustments as the share of GDP. So we will correct the record to make sure if I, if I uh, misspoke. Um, I think SNAP is a life, as you point out very eloquently, SNAP is a lifeline to the families that receive it, seniors, children, individuals with disabilities. It's a modest benefit, and yet it is, it, it is the difference between um, having enough money to purchase a healthy diet and, and not having enough money uh, uh, at all to feed your kids or to, to feed your family. So, um, you know... It, uh, cuts that would reduce eligibility or, or lower benefits uh, are, are deeply concerning to me in the abstract because we know how many families are really living on the edge and uh, what a lifeline this, this benefit is. During the pandemic, you're right, this was a moment of uh, extraordinary, uh, it was an unbelievable challenge in our country and Congress equipped uh, USDA and the states with uh, a, a tremendous flexibility to respond. So a couple of things happened. One is there was a really quick move to online shopping. That is an example of a, a feature of the program that needs to be improved, it continue to be strengthened, right? Uh, access to food. I'm sorry, yes, to allow SNAP uh, uh, to be uh, online ordering and purchasing of benefits. Uh, there were eligibility res uh, restrictions that were eased for college students, for individuals subject to this three-month time limit, where the expectation of working during the pandemic uh, uh, would not have been sensible. There was an easing of uh, the paperwork and office visit requirements, because, of course, one couldn't go to the office. And we saw that uh, uh, households were able, to, uh, uh, were able to access the benefit. And I do want to say, at a time when states had to shut down and radically change operations, we saw participation grow by several million people, in part due to their incredibly heroic efforts, but in part due to the flexibilities you offered them. They may not all make sense moving forward, but we've learned a lot about how to deliver this program to rural areas, uh, individuals for whom getting to the office is a challenge, and for whom uh, pay, uh, the, the massive quantities of paperwork we historically demand. Um, can we... Do we need it all still? Do we need to go back to where we were? So you're right, we don't want to return exactly to February, for any of us, right? We've learned about a different way of doing things. Uh, I don't want as many Zoom calls as I've had, uh, but it is a way for me to connect with people in a profoundly different way than I did before. So I hope we bring that spirit. Forward. So it, in answer to Senator Grassley's question, in answer to my question, I'd like you to uh, write a letter to the committee about <clears throat> what was SNAP before, who it served and how it served, what SNAP did during the pandemic, who it served and how it served, and what going forward you'd like to retain from the pandemic, what you don't need, and how many people you think it's going to reach with those changes, and therefore a different a budget. It has to be all written out in detail to answer his question authoritatively. And last, um, Madam 
um, Chairman, I'd like to submit a question for the record about moving Puerto Rico from NAP to SNAP because it is so unfair that the Americans who happen to live in Puerto Rico don't get the full SNAP benefit and are capped. So even as more people are added to the program, there's no more money to feed more kids. So I would like a full answer about what's happening in Puerto Rico today, who has access to it, who does not have access to it, and the destructive impact of NAP and why it should be moved to SNAP. Yes, ma'am. The short answer is the administration supports all the territories having. But I need it for the committee because yeah. this is not something that they don't have a lot of Puerto Ricans necessarily in their state. I have a lot, but they're all Americans and they deserve the same benefit. Thank you. Thank you very much. You have important homework assignments. <laughs> yes, I do. So very important. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Senator Heismith. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, witnesses, for being here today. This is most helpful. Uh, one of my concerns is for the Deputy Undersecretary Dean is that I'd like to talk about school lunch and breakfast programs in a different way. And I'm very concerned about the recent reports that cities are opting to remove animal protein from schools' meals. That's very concerning for me. Some might argue that this topic would be better suited for a child nutrition reauthorization hearing, not a Title IV farm hearing, but I disagree with that. This topic falls under the committee's jurisdiction, and we need to talk about it. For years, popular media has attacked animal agriculture and suggested that we cut back on livestock production and related food products in the name of mitigating climate change. These suggestions are very misleading. And climate activists love to blow the livestock sector's contribution to greenhouse gas emissions completely out of proportion and disregard the essential nutritional benefits of animal protein. And this sentiment is creeping into our school systems where it has the potential to irreparably harm the most vulnerable in our society, our children. And I read that for an example in... Um, Edinburgh, Scotland recently became the first European city to commit to eliminating meat from school, hospital, and nursing home means. I know that's another country, but this similar initiatives are underway in the United States, in some of our nation's largest school districts. In recent years, large public school systems in the Northeast have announced Meatless Monday and Vegan Friday initiatives School systems on the West Coast are doing the exact same thing. And it's apparent that animal source foods are the most complete and bioavailable sources of protein, are full of vitamins and nutrients such as vitamin 12, zinc, iron, and all of which are essential for healthy development in children. And I recognize that Americans have the right to make their own dietary dietary choices, and I want that to happen, but we have to consider what is in the school meals we provide to underserved children who, in most cases, do not get to choose for themselves. The health and well-being of Americans' children should not be sacrificed at the altar of climate activism. What is the USDA's response to these initiatives? And can you explain whether schools that implement these initiatives are still in compliance with the dietary guidelines for Americans? Uh, thank you, Senator, for the question. We're happy to take it. Uh, as you know, we set a high, I think federal law establishes standards and a framework for the school meal program, but districts have a lot of flexibility on how they implement. I'm actually going to ask Administrator Long to uh, jump in with some thoughts, given her expertise here. Yeah, absolutely. And um, one thing I think it's important to, to point out is that uh, USDA directly purchases uh, between 15 and 20 percent of the food that ends up on the plate in the schools, and that those purchases cross a variety of, of types. And I will stress animal proteins are, are quite well represented in the, the foods that we purchase, and those are domestically purchased foods and provided to school. As the Deputy Undersecretary mentioned, School meal regulations and requirements really provide a broad framework for communities and local schools to make choices, such as the ones you alluded to. Some schools also and communities also use that flexibility to make choices to highlight, you know, locally produced uh, items that could include a range of foods produce, you know, produced by local farmers. So the, the choices do ultimately come down to the local communities and the local schools. Thank you. And I just ask that you track that and uh, make sure that it's staying in proportion to what we need. 
Thank you, Madam Chairman. I think my time's about out. Thank you very much. Senator Booker. Thank you to the chairwoman and the ranking member. Um, I want to highlight something about SNAP eligibility, an issue that's a little broader. We've addressed it in other of my committees. But uh, during the 1990s, we had this very big uh, war on drugs uh, that caused a lot of harm to people who have paid their debt and reentered society. On the Small Business Committee, in a bipartisan way, we said that those folks who are entrepreneurs should not be ineligible for SBA programs. In a bipartisan way, in the Judiciary Committee, we addressed other eligibilities for people who had paid their debt to society. However, right now, still, uh, we have a ban on people who have drug crimes uh, and have paid their debt, have served their time, they still cannot receive SNAP benefits. Uh, hunger and food insecurity are, in, are significant challenges that formerly incarcerated individuals face after release. The SNAP ban is not just uh, one obstacle that diminishes their prospects of having a good life, but it actually increases the chance that they will recidivate. It's us being penny wise and pound foolish. Individuals face already challenges who have been formerly incarcerated in housing, employment, health care, but to exclude them from uh, programs like SNAP actually compounds their difficulties and, again, increases that risk of recidivism. Uh, it's my hope that we can come together, as we have on other committees, in a bipartisan way and fix this mistake. Uh, I request the unanimous, unanimous consent uh, to uh, put into the record this letter from a long list of groups, nonpartisan, bipartisan, uh, 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 groups uh, from multiple states represented by people on this committee asking for us to correct this mistake and actually save taxpayers money by reducing recidivism. So ordered without objection. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Dean, uh, I want to thank you for being here and I want to let you know that I think we're in the midst of one of the greatest nutrition crises our country has ever seen. Right now, half of our population in America is diabetic or pre-diabetic. Every month, in the United States of America, diabetes causes 13,000 new amputations, 5,000 new cases of kidney failure, 2,000 cases of blindness every month in America. And it's not something that's just affecting older people. It's stunning to me that we now have 25% of our teenagers are pre-diabetic or have type 2 diabetes. My colleague, uh, Joni Ernst, mentioned the, the profound reality that 77% of young people uh, ages 17 to 24 are ineligible even to serve in the military. Much of this can be attributed to the alarming fact that ultra-processed foods now compri compromise, comprise excuse me, two-thirds of the calories that children and teens eat. And so in this Farm Bill, I believe it's imperative that we scale up the nutrition programs that we know are working, that are evidence-based, that are making a difference to people's uh, uh, health and well-being. Um, we know that we can do better. We have clear evidence to that fact. One program I know that is working and we need to scale up uh, is the GUSNIP program. Uh, while we know that this program provides life-changing benefits, I've seen it myself in communities, helping people get off their prescription drugs, which cost taxpayers often money, helping people improve their lifestyle and their well-being. Uh, this program is a powerful incentive and benefit for farmers. Mm -hmm. We know that this it will help those farmers who are growing fruits and vegetables for the local community. So can you please talk about that aspect, how this is a pro-farmer helping uh, folks, uh, uh, this, this, how this pro-farmer program, GUSNIP, helps folks? Uh, thank you, Senator. I'm happy to do that. And first, let me say the administration uh, 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 supports the repeal of the um, ban on ex-offenders with a drug conviction. So thank you for lifting up that important issue. Uh, on, with respect to GUSNIP, I... Um, it gives me the opportunity to underscore our approach on nutrition security, which really has four uh, components, making sure that our benefits are meaningful, uh, increasing access to healthy food, uh, collaboration with uh, thousands of partners across the country to promote better health and nutrition, and uh, integrating equity across uh, uh, all of those uh, pillars. And GUSNIP does exactly all of that in addition to building stronger connections between our federal nutrition programs and uh, local producers and local markets. So I appreciate that's a, a, a quite a tee up you gave me there. Um, GUSNIP is a, a, 
uh, essentially the way it works, and the chair flagged it in the name in Michigan, it's double up box is one of the most popular forms where a SNAP participant would go to a farmer's market, say, here's $20 uh, in my SNAP benefits and receive $40 in tokens. But if you could, in the seconds I've left. into farmer's pockets. That's, that's exactly. what I'm, yes. So it really is, help, you're seeing it fundamentally empower our local farmers. And increase fruit and vegetable intake, yes. And, and increase fruit, fruits and yes. vegetables intake. I really appreciate that. I've got another uh, question I'm gonna put into the record about um, how SNAP Ed uh, can be redesigned so that it can start uh, to reach uh, more of the 90 million low-income Americans that we need to reach, and I'm hoping I can get that for the record. Terrific, and we share that goal. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, Senator Thune, you always manage to time it right when it's your turn to ask questions. So kudos to your staff or whoever is keeping track of things as you juggle your schedule. Senator well, Thune. It makes my staff happy and my colleagues very annoyed. Um, so, But uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Bozeman for holding today's hearing to consider the nutrition programs in the Farm Bill. Uh, I also want to thank our USDA um, panelists for appearing before the committee today. And let me just, if I can, uh, direct this uh, Deputy Undersecretary Dean to you. Um, SNAP benefits are generally provided in one monthly allotment. Uh, the data suggested correlation between the consumption of SNAP benefits and outcomes like academic performance. For example, research indicates that student performance tapers the farther SNAP recipients get from the date of their SNAP benefit transfer. Um, so I'm reviewing whether Congress should look at how to provide states the authority to distribute SNAP benefits in two allotments per month for recipients who would like to receive their benefits in two installments uh, instead of one lump sum, lump sum payment. Uh, and I believe this uh, could help improve program outcomes by incentivizing healthy food purchases and boosting educational performance among recipients. Could also help ease demand on grocery stores and make it harder for grocery price hikes that could be aligned with the dates of SNAP benefit distribution. So uh, the question is, do you agree that program outcomes could improve if SNAP recipients have the option to receive split issuance rather than only once a month and, and then any other ideas you would have for improving SNAP outcomes? Thank you, Senator Thune. Um, let me just, uh, I've I, I read the research that you're talking about, and I just want to flag that, of course, that was done before our adjustment to the Thrifty Food Plan, where, where we now really are much more confident that the benefit will, is adequate to um, purchase and cover the costs, or supplement the costs of uh, a healthy diet throughout the month. So it'd be interesting to see what the uh, issues are there. You met, uh, you're flagging a provision of the law um, that Congress passed, I believe it was in the 2008 Farm Bill, to prohibit splitting issuance into more than one allotment. I think the concern then there was the, issue, the impact on participants and stores, the issue of potentially the increased cost of shopping, particularly in rural areas, say if a household has to drive a long way to a store, disrupting household budgets. Um, the cost of issuing twice, uh, states would be charged uh, uh, twice by their processors, but um, and potentially a visit to emergency food. But now with the benefit being uh, 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 perhaps uh, our current estimate of an adequate level, um, and if one could address some of those concerns maybe by giving households the option to choose, if there would, uh, it, seem, it, feels, it seems interesting to explore whether uh, shifting the issuance um, uh, I guess I, I guess my answer is I don't know. I would want to talk more with your staff about it. But the, okay. Congress did make the decision to uh, prohibit it out of concern of what the impact on households would be. So, yeah. which I know is something you would want to address. Yeah, and I think if we get would like to continue that discussion with you on that subject. Um, both Congress and the executive branch have implemented processes to serve as checks and balances on federal spending. Your biography notes that you served as a budget analyst at the Office of Management and Budget. And given your experience, I'm sure you understand the important role that OMB plays in overseeing the outlay of tax dollars. So according to the Government Accountability Office, the, the Thrifty Food Plan, or TFP, reevaluation re you oversaw allowed plan costs to increase beyond inflation for the first time, resulting in a 21% increase in SNAP benefits. So I guess the question is, what input did OMB provide as USDA made uh, TFP changes that are expected to cost approximately $250 billion more over 10 years? 
Uh, the process of the reevaluation was done by a very uh, technical team within USDA. We did consult with OMB along the way. Um, most of they and they did provide us some uh, economic analysis support throughout. But uh, I'm not. But I, I ultimately, OMB was very supportive of the change. Again, directed by Congress, and it was the first adjustment in purchasing power for low-income households in over 45 years. Uh, we, I think they uh, shared with us the, um, uh, uh, the confidence that this would uh, put healthy food within reach for millions more households and uh, were pleased with the impact it had on poverty. So, but they, just to your point, to, 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 to uh, confirm that they did sign off, OMB signed off. On, I don't on know that, that sign-off is a technical term, sir, so uh, we'd probably want to uh, check in, but we, were, we, uh, we absolutely uh, were uh, collaborated with them uh, throughout the process, so happy to get you the official, okay. official phrase. That would be helpful because it's, I mean, it's a quarter of a trillion dollar increase, um, a unilateral decision made by an agency. It seems like they would, you know, obviously be, uh, want to be engaged in that. I see my time has expired, uh, Madam Chair, so thank you. Thank you very much. And now I'll turn to Senator Durbin, who on Thursdays I know juggles between chairing judiciary, which is so very important as well, and being here. And we are really happy that you were able to make it today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Bozeman, it's an honor to be here. It's true that I spend most of my time in the Judiciary Committee on Thursdays. I'm happy I could join you today. We have a rich tradition in the Judiciary Committee to honor chairs. Uh, we ask chairman to submit an 8 by 10 black and white photograph, which is then um, mounted on a store-bought frame uh, on the wall. And uh, I'm looking forward to the day I receive that honor, and I want to congratulate you on your own. Uh, I think the portrait is beautiful. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to coming to your photo or portrait unveiling, whichever it is. Well, we don't have an official unveiling. <laughs> But seriously, it's beautiful. Uh, secondly, I would like to make a plea, and I don't know if this is appropriate, since Senator Marshall is promoting whole milk for nursing mothers. I once visited the Guinness Brewery in Dublin, and they have a policy of giving to nursing mothers one glass of Guinness a day. <laughs> they think that's very healthy, and with rosy-cheeked Irish children, I think they must be right. So if he is allowed to bring whole milk, can we ask the Irish Embassy for their help? We, it, it will certainly consider. That's a possibility. Thank I you. Think. <laughs> On a more serious note, <clears throat> I thank the team from the USDA. Illinois has operated a program for more than 20 years providing health care services to 8,000 elderly, disabled, and community-style apartments who prefer those to nursing homes. These supportive living facilities provide meals to these frail, low-income individuals across our state through SNAP. What they do is pool the benefits of the people who are receiving these meals to lower their bills and spare them from going out to shop. This program worked well. No financial wrongdoing, and that's been confirmed by the USDA over 20 years. Accessible health and nutrition, giving mom and dad more independent living options in a creative way. They're not asking for more. They're taking what they are legally entitled to and pooling it into an effort to have community meals. Suddenly, a few years ago, the U.S. Department of Agriculture decided these facilities were institutions. Nothing had changed in Illinois, no statutory definition of institution, and these facilities provide three meals a day for two decades with no complaint from anybody. The surprise was that the USDA decision to terminate SNAP benefits for the people who, if they moved back home in isolation, would still qualify. If they left the community apartment uh, living uh, environment and went to their own homes, there wouldn't be no question about the SNAP benefits. So, Ms. Dean, do you agree that this situation arose not because Illinois or these facilities did anything wrong, but because the USDA changed its mind after 20 years? Uh, Senator, first, I appreciate you bringing up the senior living facilities in Illinois. It's in a really innovative uh, home-based and community care setting, and you're right to uh, you're right to bring it to the attention of others. Uh, the situation occurred because USDA improperly uh, al allowed the institutions into for how long? Many years. Twenty years. Many That's years. it. Sorry. That's the reason. Yes. 
uh, and we're now working very closely with Illinois and your office to explore other options uh, in order to continue to uh, see if there's a way for the federal government to support these facilities in offering the great care that you describe. Thank you for that. Senator Duckworth and I added a provision working with Senator Stabenow in the last farm bill to extend the status quo. Uh, CBO added a new surprise when, when we made this suggestion keeping the status quo now somehow costs money and must be scored. But nothing had changed in Illinois in 20 years. USDA terminated SNAP for these residents last December 31st. Terminated SNAP. The state was forced to obtain a temporary Medicaid waiver to partially replace the shortfall of SNAP funds. I don't get it. These are people, seniors, disabled people, eligible for SNAP, who are taking their check in and pooling it with others that they're living with so they can have a community meal. And all of a sudden, this is illegal after 20 years. We need a solution. I hope you can assure me that you'll work with me in finding one. In earnest, sir. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Senator Fisher. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Our nutrition programs play an important role in helping families navigate difficult times. Unfortunately, we know perhaps the biggest economic challenge facing Americans is inflation. In particular, families have been hit hard by inflation at the grocery store. Since President Biden took office, the Food at Home Price Index is up 19.6%. Grocery prices for many family staples have skyrocketed. For example, chicken breast prices are up 32%, milk up 21%, ground beef up 21%. As we have a discussion about our nutrition programs ahead of the next Farm Bill, I think it's important we also recognize how inflation and policies that have contributed to it impact the ability of families to put nutritious meals on the table. Ms. Dean, as you know, our food banks and local food pantries play a critical role in helping to provide for families in need. In Nebraska, the Food Bank of Lincoln and the Food Bank for the Heartland rely on the Emergency Food Assistance Program, TFAP, along with philanthropic support to distribute food to local food pantries and families in need. Since the 2018 Farm Bill, we have also seen some innovative programs outside of TFAP designed to aid food banks, banks such as the Farmers to Family Food Box Program, which is, has been quite successful in my state of Nebraska. Could you discuss lessons learned from the Farmers to Families Food Box Program or other initiatives that helped food banks to better service our, their partners? How could these lessons apply to TFAP as we think about the upcoming Farm Bill? Well, thank you, Senator. I really appreciate that question. Um, you're exactly right that uh, our food banks are incredible assets uh, in the communities that they serve, and uh, we really want to do what we can to support them as they feed our neighbors. Um, I would say that there are two, um, there were many lessons, but I'll take away two particularly from that, uh, that endeavor that we wanted to carry forward. One is, it's very clear that there are thousands of organizations throughout the country that are working to serve individuals in their community who were able to um, step in and they distributed those, mm -hmm. uh, they were part of the community that distributed those farmers to families food boxes, but they may not actually be connected to the emergency food network that USDA supports through TFAP. Uh, and uh, we, we wanted to find a way to continue to harness their power uh, in their communities and to, bring, and to see if they were interested to bring them in to the uh, emergency food system. That's why the secretary launched what he's, we are calling reach and resiliency grants. Uh, to each state to explore how to expand the um, emergency food network into communities, particularly rural and remote, that may not have been well served by it before. So um, that's one lesson. The other is that uh, offering food banks and our local community partners pre-packed boxes was a really interesting innovation that worked and saved uh, labor and volunteer hours. So we've incorporated that into a pre-packed uh, fruit and vegetable box that's uh, become popular amongst our food banks as an item to order. So we'll continue to integrate um, lessons learned so that we can uh, strengthen, strengthen the program and the network as they uh, 
and I would just say we work very collaboratively with them, driven Great. by what they see they need. That's good to hear. Thank you. In your statement, you noted that Congress had provided the option for states to suspend certain quality control requirements during COVID. Um, I was in touch with food banks all across the state um, during uh, those difficult times when we saw uh, people isolated, when we saw numbers increase of the usage of food banks, uh, while at the same time a decrease in, in volunteer service at those facilities. So it, it was a hard time, um, a challenging time to man maneuver through. But USDA uh, could not establish national or state level payment error rates for two years during that time. However, you noted USDA did continue to analyze trends that it's not surprising to see elevated error rates during such a challenging and complex time, but that it is incumbent up upon USDA to address this with states. So my question is, states still have a variety of options on how to administer SNAP. How is USDA working with states to ensure program integrity? Well, first I will say while Congress did um, suspend the quality control system during the early part of the pandemic, uh, we kept corrective action plans in place. We kept that, which meaning states that were struggling with error rates, uh, that we have a formal agreement with them and steps they're supposed to take. Those all remained in place. We remained very much engaged mm -hmm. with states on uh, making sure that they were monitoring uh, and taking action to reduce errors. It's also true that during the pandemic, states lost staff. Um, they had to shift their mode of operations and remote, uh, remote services uh, made, some for, made administration of the mm -hmm. program more challenging. So when I say uh, it's, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not acceptable, but it is also true that states would be challenged on uh, precision accuracy. It was a time in our country we were leaning into providing assistance and mm -hmm. we told states to take that direction. That having been said, uh, stewarding these, uh, the, the program and uh, managing federal taxpayer dollars is incredibly important. So we work with states on um, assessing their uh, operations, taking a look at whether they uh, have practices or, as you point out, options that might be uh, making their program more error prone. There might be, um, uh, uh, it could be their forms design, the way their call centers are structured. We're very actively engaged with them on, um, and we put them in touch with peers who may look similar and have less important lessons mm -hmm. learned on how to provide access while reducing payment, uh, improving. Have, have you found um, any examples where there's one or two things that's, that seem to be happening across states? You said to put them in touch with their peers. Have you found examples where um, the, the challenge, the problem, the issue um, seems to be prevalent? Staffing has been a challenge across many states. Uh, so, and then I think also the amount of paperwork that they're asking for states, they need it to assess eligibility. Uh, but it also means that, um, let's say, if you asked for six weeks of pay stubs when federal rules allow you to ask for four, that you're, you're now looking for more paper, you've got mm -hmm. more, uh, more things to sift through. Um, I think, uh, so those are examples. There are also, um, I'm trying to think, options uh, where um, uh, targeting longer phone interviews with households that might be uh, more, or interviews with households that have more complex cases and spending less time on a household that's pretty straightforward, perhaps a senior with stable income, they've lived mm -hmm. in the same place for a long time. You wouldn't want to spend the same amount of time on those households. Mm -hmm. So helping uh, engage with them there on uh, balancing their work. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair and Ranking Member Bozeman. And um, I want to just thank Senator Fisher for your questions and your focus on food banks. I, my guest at the State of the Union was Allison O'Toole, who leads the largest food bank in Minnesota. And I appreciate you highlighting how important that is. So, so thank you. Um, colleagues, this is such an important hearing. I've appreciated being able to be here and listen to the give and take and the questions. And I'm going to just take a moment to remind everybody here that about who it is, who are the people that we're talking about. Um, Two-thirds of SNAP recipients are families with children. 
A third are families with older adults or people with disabilities. And Under Secretary Dean, I really appreciated your conversation with Senator Klobuchar about how uh, we can overcome the barriers that working people face as they are going back to work and relying on SNAP as a really important um, um, resource for them. And Hennepin County in Minnesota is a great model of that. So thank you for that. And many people relying on SNAP are folks that live in rural communities. Nearly 175,000 rural Minnesotans don't have enough to eat. Food shelf data from 2022 in Minnesota showed that some of the biggest increases in food shelf visits occurred in rural Minnesota. So um, I just think it's important to ground ourselves in who it is that we're talking about here. And um, it's helpful to me as I think about what we need to focus on in this committee. Um, I want to dig in a little bit on what we can do to connect people who rely on SNAP um, um, to um, healthy food, how it connects them with local producers and especially farmers markets. A little bit about what Senator Booker was getting at um, and Senator um, Welsh as well. So you have EBT cards that are basically debit cards for SNAP recipients to use to pay for their groceries. And each year millions of dollars of federal benefits are spent at farmers markets in Minnesota um, so that shoppers can buy their food there. And of course it's complicated, right? Because individual farm stands can't necessarily set up the technology to act to, to accept EBT cards. So what happens at a lot of farmers markets is that there's a central booth where people can um, exchange the benefits on their card for tokens that they can then use um, at vendor stands. And this works pretty well for shoppers and for vendors. Um, but I'm hearing um, from farmers markets in Minnesota that there's some worry that this might go away, that there might be some change in this system. And of course, we want to make it easier, not harder, for producers to accept SNAP. So I'm going to just ask you, um, can you talk about a little bit about how SNAP can reinforce and support local producers and what the USDA is doing to help um, vendors and um, farmers and farmers markets have the equipment and technology they need to process um, SNAP benefits. Yeah, thank you, Senator. Um, and happy to follow up with you to learn more so we can directly respond to that particular concern. But generally, um, we are we're taking a number of steps to try to make it easier for farmers to accept payments electronically. As you point out, or I think I th yes. we were sort of suggesting you have to go into a farmer's market to a central office um, swipe your card for such a fixed amount, then you get tokens, and then the farmers can take the, and then the farmers have to go back to the central office at the end of the day and cash out. And that um, just, that puts some friction in the system, both for the farmers and SNAP participants. So we're really trying to support farmers to make it easier for them to accept payment electronically. We've provided an e-commerce platform basically sort of the back-end payment uh, software. We are providing an app to farmers. Uh, so again, to try to move away from the tokens, but a more electronic, um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. and not, not just uh, farmers markets, but also uh, roadside stands. And we've recently provided a grant to the National Association for Farmers Markets Nutrition Program organization to uh, help, uh, help be the bridge between uh, us and individual farmers markets to support them in this shift. So we welcome ideas for more that we can do. This is uh, uh, an absolute commitment on our end to um, bring in more markets and uh, make electronic payment easier. Great, thank you. I really appreciate that. And we'll continue this conversation because I appreciate it's good to remove as much friction as we can from the system to the benefit of the producers and also the, the customers. Um, Ms. Long, I have a quick, a quick question about the food distribution program on Indian reservations, um, FDIPR, these ridiculous acronyms. Um, so people living on tribal lands often live in food deserts. They're many miles from a grocery store. That means they're not going to be able to take their EBT card into a store. And one of the things that they, we do instead is allow them to receive a month, monthly food package. The question is what's in that package, and is the food in that package um, does it meet the health and cultural needs of Native people? For example, many Native people are lactose intolerant, and so having milk in that package is not going to work. Um, I want to—I know that you all are focused on this, and I appreciate this through the work you're doing with the Equity Action Plan. Ms. Long, in the 2018 Farm Bill, we authorized a pilot program to explore how the food distribution program could include food that is culturally appropriate um, and also hopefully procured directly by tribes. Can you tell us what we've learned? from that program. 
Yeah, thank you. I'd be happy to. Um, just to summarize, we have uh, been able to, we, we have utilized the resources provided in the Farm Bill. Uh, we have, I believe it is currently nine. Uh, projects that are underway under that 638 process uh, where tribal nations are responsible for directly procuring food and providing it to their members. Um, and I'm also very happy to say that we just recently um, reopened that process and allowed uh, more applicants. That period just closed, and we are, are quite confident that given the quality of the applications we received, we are going to be able to fully utilize the resources that have been provided to expand the use of that option. That's great. Madam Chair, I look forward to continuing work on that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Braun. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Ranking Member Bozeman. Um, I'm on the Agriculture Committee, uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. Um, I'm on a committee called Budget Committee, which um, sadly has been relegated into almost a useless appendage here in the federal government. We haven't done a budget that we've adhered to in decades. Um, agriculture is dear to me because I come from an agriculture community, been involved with it as a tree farmer, row crop. I look at how we spend money in the farm bill, and 82 percent of it is for nutrition. Um, 11 percent would be for safety net programs with crop insurance, commodity supports, and then conservation, uh, roughly 4 percent begs a question in that we don't do budgets anymore and ag like maybe defending our country ought to be things that we do well um, but you have to live within your means uh, I'd like to point out while you have opportunities like this uh, we currently are borrowing near nearly 30 percent of what we spend annually it was closer to 20 percent when i got here that is not a good business plan for the long run. Um, I'm mostly preaching at this point. Uh, I'm going to be interested to see how the farm bill has turned into a nutrition bill, and it's all part of the issue. And you find out here, uh, Senator Thune pointed to it earlier, that the thrifty food plan increased by over 21 percent, and it's now going to shove the farm bill into uh, over a trillion dollar trajectory over the next 10 years. I think for anybody listening out there, it's unsustainable and the hallmark of our country and for places where it works well, you live within your means. The economy, when you're knocking it out of the park, grows between two and a half and three percent in recent times. That's generally done with a little lighter regulation and tax incentives to the productive side of the economy that make sure you're at least generating revenues that this place needs to live upon. Those are at record levels currently, I think due to the tax framework that was put into place. Um, and I think you gotta look at each part of our federal government and one that is probably most practical, farmers, who uh, participate to the tune of about 11% in the farm bill, they are the ones that produce the food that becomes our nutrition. Um, what guidelines uh, are we using within the ag department um, on the simple issue of food insecurity? I think the benchmark is that we try to get that under 10%. Uh, we haven't done that in 20 years. That's almost similar. We haven't balanced a budget in 20 years. Um, and I think twice as many folks are under the SNAP program. Um, why aren't we reaching that goal when we're spending tons of money more and seem to be going the opposite way? Uh, help me understand that. Um, thank you, Senator, for the question, and thank you for your leadership on the White House conference on um, hunger, nutrition, and health, which I think really was, uh, was the objective was to tackle both this issue and, of course, the deep connections between um, diet-related disease and health, right? We are both seeking to address people's needs today with food insecurity, uh, but also uh, make an investment in the future in better health by uh, stronger federal nutrition programs. I mean, I think you ask a really important question, and um, to some extent, I think the answer is a little outside of federal nutrition. Certainly, we've adjusted, we are making changes to the federal nutrition programs to ensure that our support is meaningful and to push the needle on that issue of food insecurity that you raise. 
But it's also the case that I think some of our programs are being asked to do too much. Uh, I think um, SNAP benefits are, uh, are are covering a whole food budget when households are supposed to contribute their income, but their income is strapped because they're a working family that can't afford childcare. Their health insurance might be uh, out of reach for them, or they're living in a state that hasn't offered Medicaid coverage. The refundable child tax credit is no longer there for them. I think during the pandemic, we saw where investments in the safety net, bolstering workers and unemployed workers can make a profound difference with respect to poverty and food insecurity. And uh, it is other parts of our critical safety net that need shoring up so that uh, uh, household income isn't drawn away from meeting their food needs for other purposes. And you even brought up a few more things that we try to do through the federal government, and there's a need for it, and I don't deny that. But somehow, when you look at the macro figures I mentioned a little bit ago, the economy grows at 3% a year when you're knocking it out of the park. Things can't grow here at rates beyond that because you're borrowing from future generations. And if we don't get better at finding like we do on Main Street, uh, when I confronted 08 and 09, I thought I had a lean business. It was not hard to find savings of five, even up to 10%. That's not even in our vocabulary now. And what's in our vocabulary is that we borrow money from future generations for good causes. But if we're gonna look to the federal government to be there in a way that people are gonna believe it and not delivering results where you can't get food insecurity under 10% when we've been trying so hard, spending so much money, maybe we need to look inside are we running things like most other places would have to to make those trade-offs to get a better result? Keep working hard at it. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Warnock. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and congratulations on the celebration we had so well-deserved for you last night. Look forward to working with you over the next two years. Thank you. Um, I, I'm struck... Um, um, just by the reality of my sitting here five years ago when the um, farm bill was uh, reauthorized as it is every five years, uh, I was actually here, uh, but I was outside uh, protesting and uh, dealing with the issue of, of food insecurity and in the spirit of, of uh, Martin Luther King Jr. In, in whose pulpit I still preach in an act of civil disobedience, I actually got arrested uh, protesting some of the cuts around food insecurity and the farm bill. And uh, it's good to be here and to have a voice and to be sitting at the table to help write the bill. Well, we're so pleased that you are here. Thank, thank you so much. Um, but when I think about the urgency of our work, think about those times and this time, I think about Nia from Dallas, Georgia. She's a disabled mother of four on food stamps who wrote into my office last year asking for Congress to increase funding for nutrition programs. She said what I would usually spend for a month of food only lasts about two weeks. It's hard to tell a kid, to tell your kid that mommy can't buy that this month. It costs too much. This idea of children being hungry in the wealthiest nation on the planet, for me, speaks to the heart uh, of the gospel that I try to preach uh, and embody um, uh, every week. I'm a Matthew 25 Christian. Jesus said, in as much as you've done it unto the least of these, you've done it also unto me. So I think, for me, it's always the moral question and how do we center the concerns of ordinary people uh, like Nia, uh, which it occurs to me is Swahili for purpose. What is, what is our purpose uh, in this moment? And I think it is to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Uh, today in America, uh, federal law, uh, in some instances it seems to me, uh, informed and supported by um, a view of the faith that sees it as a weapon rather than a bridge, is denying food assistance to returning citizens. 
returning citizens who were previously convicted of a drug-related felony, including nonviolent offenders and those who have served their time at a time when we understand much more than we did 30 years ago, 40 years ago about uh, drug use, the, the ways in which huge swaths of our population, whether we're talking about poor urban black folks or poor white uh, people in rural communities engaged in self-medication and dealing with this illness. So convicted of a drug-related felony are, are being denied, having paid their price, paid their debt to society, being denied food assistance. Uh, the Biden administration, Ms. Dean, has proposed to eliminate this restriction. Why is this a high priority for the administration, and who would be helped? Uh, thank you, Senator, and thank you for slowing things down and uh, reminding us of why, uh, why, we're, why these federal nutrition programs yeah. exist. Um, the Biden administration per, uh, supports enthusiastically repealing the ban, uh, which is a state option, because it, um, uh, it worsens food hardship, as you just said. When an individual is leaving, uh, uh, is leaving incarceration, we want to support successful reentry. That, that, and uh, denying food uh, undermines that fundamental goal. Reentry rather than recidivism. Exactly. A am I right that people will find a way to eat? Yes, and the um, NIH did a study that showed that this group is overwhelmingly uh, economically insecure, they're food insecure, a third reported in a survey that they had uh, missed food for an entire day. So uh, in order to meet our food security goals, our uh, successful reentry goals, and of course, um, uh, drug offenses, individuals convicted of drug offenses, it's a much higher rate of uh, conviction yeah. amongst African Americans than whites, so it meets our um, equity goals as well. And I'm sad to say that my state of Georgia, while many states have lifted these barriers, my state of Georgia still requires people with drug fel felony convictions to complete all of their probation and all of their parole requirements to receive nutrition assistance. And Georgia, as you may know, has the highest rate of correctional supervision in the country. So you've got a huge part of the population under supervision, and until they complete all the requirements, uh, basic food insecurity uh, is, is the problem of these returning citizens. Do you think that it would be easier for these folks to find a job and stay on the right path if they had access to basic nutrition with food benefits and don't have to wonder how they will pay for their next meal? Yes, sir, I do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Senator Hoven. Thank you, Madam Chair. And again, I want to add my congratulations as well uh, to the portrait. It really is fantastic. Uh, and uh, thank both you and the ranking member for holding this uh, important hearing. Secretary Administrator, thanks to both of you for being here. Um, Secretary, would you agree that we want to make sure that people who need help having access to adequate food receive it? And at the same time, we want to make sure that the program is as cost effective as possible uh, and that we want to always have incentives to get people to self-sufficiency. Would, would you agree with that? Yes, sir. Okay, then in that process, how do tools like the National Accuracy Clearinghouse for SNAP help uh, USDA meet those goals? And, um, and what can we do to make sure that we're meeting the need but reducing instances of waste, fraud, uh, and abuse in the nutrition programs? I think the National Accuracy Clearinghouse, or as we call it, the NAC, sometimes uh, will serve both of those goals. Uh, the NAC is set up, the USDA is setting up a nationwide platform uh, to work with states to ensure that individuals are not dually enrolled. So if someone applying in Maryland, uh, the state will have the ability through this platform to check whether they're enrolled in SNAP somewhere else in the country. So that prevents dual participation, which is a program integrity goal, but it's also a program service and access goal because there may be someone who lived in D.C. who moved to Maryland who told D.C., please disenroll me, uh, and that didn't happen by the time they were seeking to enroll in Maryland. And so we hope that through the NAC we'll be able to facilitate um, the swift removal, uh, removal, disenrollment of someone from one state and while uh, before they seek um, participation on, in another. The research that we have overwhelmingly shows that is where we have the experience of um, 
uh, again, this issue of friction, someone trying to, as someone moves across state lines, the experience of dual participation fraudulently is extremely rare, but this tool will help us to prevent it. Are there other uh, programs or, or steps you're taking to make sure you're meeting the need, but also doing it as cost effectively as possible? I would think online shopping is a good example of that, where we want to, meaning uh, where SNAP participants can purchase uh, food through an online platform that grocers offer. We want, that's a terrific access tool. We also need to take steps uh, to identify and determine if that exposes us to more risk in terms of theft or trafficking in the program. So we're, uh, we're both um, offering that new uh, option as a customer service enhancement, but then working to, um, uh, track and identify any security risk there. Yeah. Again, I think anytime you can help people that need it, but also create incentives for self um, uh, empowerment, uh, and then make sure you're delivering those programs as cost effectively as possible. And that's a win. And you have to have all of those focuses together. And you're hearing that, of course, in this hearing, I think, pretty clearly. Well, and if I may, sir, I think the changes that Congress directed us to take with our SNAP employment and training program does exactly that as well. Uh, we have uh, been enc encouraged uh, to work with states to reorient and, and design them to be more evidence-based, workforce-based programs. So we can identify individuals on SNAP who need better employment and connect them to uh, those good, high-quality um, uh, jobs. Yeah, the other thing I want to bring up is really um, prior to the increase in um, August of 21 to the Thrifty uh, Food Program, um, the, uh, those types of changes uh, or increases had typically uh, been done through Congress on a bipartisan basis. And uh, in this case, there was a very significant increase, which was done by USDA unilaterally. Um, don't you feel that that's the kind of thing? And, and even GAO, GAO came back and said that should have been done through a rule process. Um, shouldn't those kind of changes be done uh, by Congress? Uh, and uh, how do you intend to approach that in the future? Senator Hoven, the Secretary for uh, Secretary of USDA for decades has had the authority to um, uh, assess the Thrifty Food Plan. The 2018 Farm Bill actually direct, directed him uh, by 2022 to reevaluate it uh, rel with respect to four particular criteria and to do it every five years thereafter. Uh, so we um, we ex we pursued that reevaluation and the change to the Thrifty and the subsequent change to SNAP uh, at congressional direction. I, it, we stand by our process. Uh, it was a robust uh, data-driven endeavor, and it resulted in increasing SNAP benefits by 40 cents per person per meal, which we think puts healthy food within reach of millions of households. So you think that should be done by administrative fiat rather than congressional action? No, sir, I'm sorry. Let me, re let me respond to that specific question. It is a congressional directive now. Uh, we are required to do it every five years, according to the changes. And I'm asking whether you're going to come back and consult with Congress in that process or do it unilaterally. We learned a lot about the process and how to do it best this go around. We are. Uh, we will absolutely pursue uh, continuous improvement and uh, uh, are eager to continue to consult with you all. I would think that'd be something that Congress would certainly want to consider in the next farm bill in terms of how that process is, uh, you know, performed going forward. Th thank you both for being here. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, Senator Bozeman. Ms. Long, you were at uh, FNS in 2018 provided technical assistance, correct? I was at FNS in 2016, okay. 18, yes. Yeah, 2018. Um, what was your understanding of the cost of the Thrifty Food uh, update? You know, Senator, at that time, I was the uh, Associate Administrator for the Child Nutrition Programs, and so I, I simply was not involved in the well, conversations. You, you would say, though, that since it scored at zero, right? Is that correct? It, my understanding is that it could So the cost was zero. supposed to be zero, okay? I understand that it scored at zero. Correct? Yeah, exactly. And that was with USDA input. That was with congressional input. The entire farm bill scored at $867 billion. You spent $250 billion unilaterally. 
Congress had no intention of you doing that. None. And if you understood that that was going to happen, then you should have alerted Congress, because it's not just $250 billion. What we're understanding now, with your ability to in the future, we're talking about another $90 billion. So a third of a trillion dollars with an $867 billion bill. I mean, how can we trust you going forward to give us good advice? The other problem, too, is because of this tremendous expenditure, we're looking at a base of a, of a trillion and a half dollars. You know, you're, what you're going to do is crowd out our ability to use funds because you've already spent them on other programs. So this is far-reaching. It's a big deal. And uh, it sounds like uh, OMB was not involved either by the answer to And we can find out. We'll be glad to do that. But it sounds like this was a very, very small group, no consultation, spending a quarter of a trillion dollars from this committee, the House committee. Uh, that's totally unacceptable. And like I say, the big thing is that's going to really limit, I think, our ability to help the other programs, which I desperately want to do. So thank you. Ranking thank you. And let me just say, I think let me just conclude. Um, uh, and, um, and we have such wonderful bipartisan support in the committee, but we, with all due respect, have a difference on, on how we approach this. So I, I just, first of all, want to say that whether commodity programs go up or down or SNAP goes up and down, those monies aren't traded. They're totally separate programs, totally separate. So we cut SNAP. It doesn't add money. Commodity title, we, we, we you know, to add money. The commodity title, it doesn't a, a, a affect SNAP. And so, but I will say this, having been deeply involved in writing that farm bill that in 2018, I don't, we don't know why CBO scored it the way they did, um, but the reality is that we um, put in place a policy to do a thorough update that hadn't been done since 1975. It's written right in the Farm Bill. And, and that's what happened. I mean, the, the Trump administration chose not to do that because this was 2018, chose not to proceed. Uh, the Biden administration came in and then chose to proceed, which I'm very glad that they did. Um, but it, it was uh, to say, and there may be some disagreements on how that was done or whatever, but I would just say in terms of the directive, it was a directive in, in the Farm Bill. And so I know we're going to have important discussions about all of this. Um, and, um, but I think it is important to say that we, we passed a Farm Bill that required that to happen. And um, so, but that, let me also, Senator Brown, um, who's not able to be with us today, but he's in Ohio because there was a train derailment and he needed to be there, but he cares deeply about these issues, a member of our nutrition subcommittee. So just want to acknowledge that he uh, had called and felt uh, very bad that he wasn't able to, to be here with us today as well. It's been a very important discussion. We have a lot of work to do together, and I, I strongly support the Farm Safety Net, and as Senator Bozen was talking about, we've got a lot of work to do to to address the Farm Safety Net. I also strongly support the Family Safety Net. I know it, we do in general, we just got some work to do together as we figure out how we're going to proceed on, on all of this and the numbers. But I thank everybody for being here. Uh, the record will remain open for five business days, and the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>